Okay, hello everybody. Uh, last time we started a new topic. We discussed electrostatics. Uh, and we noticed that our world is arranged in such a way that there are electric charges. There are electric charges of two types, positive and negative. And the like charges attract, uh, the like charges <laughs> repel, and unlike charges attract. And uh, this force of interaction between charges uh, is observed even if the charges are in absolute vacuum. It means, we discussed, that the vacuum is not an empty space, is not an absolute nothing, nothingness. Uh, vacuum is filled with something. We don't know what is it, but we call it a physical vacuum. And we understand that a physical vacuum possesses complicated uh, properties. And one of the properties of physical vacuum is the ability to convey electric fields and electric interaction, electrostatic uh, in particular, interaction. What does it mean? It means that it each electric charge distorts physical vacuum in the space around it, around the charge. And uh, if a small point charge, uh, we say a probe charge, is placed into some point of space in the vicinity of another charge, then the probe charge will feel the distortion of vacuum, and that will result in the force of interaction between the two charges. Uh, so each electric charge interacting with, with another charge uh, feels the distorted vacuum created by another charge. That is the physical uh, reason behind this interaction. And the interaction is described by Coulomb's law. And uh, we discussed it last time. And also we started discussing uh, electric capacitor which consists of two parallel plates made of conducting material like metal. And if we take some charge from the lower plate and put it on the upper plate, then the upper plate will be charged like minus Q, and the lower plate will carry the charge plus Q. And there will be some potential difference U between the plates. And we understand that the charge of the capacitor is proportional to potential difference between the plates. And the coefficient of proportionality is called a uh, capacitance of the capacitor. So in order to obtain uh, some expression for the capacitance, in order to be able to calculate the capacitance of a flat capacitor, we will carry out some uh, calculations, and uh, it's, it's, it's well known that the potential difference, by definition, by definition, is defined like uh, some amount of work which is performed when a small charge delta Q is carried from one plate to another plate. And the amount of work is force times displacement. By definition, force is the electric force acting on the charge in between the plates. And the distance, the displacement of the charge, is the distance d between the plates of the capacitor. So as this is the force acting on the charge, it may be expressed as the field strength, field strength times the charge. Field strength times the charge multiplied by the distance between the plates and divided by delta Q. So by canceling del delta Q, we obtain that the potential difference is the field strength times the distance between the charge, between the charged plates, between the charged plates, this distance. So if we know the uh, formula expressing the potential difference, uh, through the field, in, uh, field intensity, field strength, 
inside the capacitor, we may say that the capacitance will be equal to the charge of the capacitor divided by E d. But we understand that if the charge is 0 and the capacitor is not charged at all, then there will be no electric field inside, and the electric field strength will also be 0. And if the charge grows, if we increase the charge, then the electric field inside the capacitor will, be, will increase. So that these two quantities, the charge and the electric field strength, must be proportional to one another. And so that if they are proportional, then we must find the coefficient of proportionality in order to simplify this formula. In order to, fi to find the coefficient of proportionality between the electric field strength and the charge of the capacitor, we, we will consider this, uh, this small issue on a different example. I will take a small, I will take a point charge plus Q. And the electric field strength at the distance r, at the distance r from this charge, will be given by some vector e at this point r. And vector e in magnitude is known to, to be equal to k, the central point charge q divided by r squared, where r is the distance of the point of observation from the central point charge. And the k, we discussed it last time in the international system, is 9 times 10 to the ninth power in the SI system. <coughs> well, in this formula, we also notice that the magnitude of electric field strength E is proportional to the charge which creates this electric field. But there is some, uh, some quantity in denominator, which is a distance squared, so that this depends on the distance. In order to somehow eliminate this dependence on the distance squared, I will imagine a sphere surrounding the central charge, the sphere of radius r. And this sphere will have a the area of the surface, the surface area s, equal to 4 pi r squared. Now, if I multiply this equation by the area s, I will obtain from here that e times s will be equal to kq divided by r squared and multiplied by s by 4 pi r squared. r squared will cancel, and I will obtain 4 pi k q, the central point charge. This expression contains no distance at all. And that's very useful when you have an expression which does not contain distance. It contains only the central charge. And so that this quantity is very important and very useful. And this physical quantity is called a flux of electric field and is denoted by a Greek character uh, um, phi. Well, maybe f, uh, phi probably. <laughs> uh, capital phi, capital Greek phi. That is the electric charge, uh, electric flux. <coughs> That is the electric flux. So that we can say that the flux of, the, of vector E through the surface of the sphere is defined by the central charge inside the sphere, which is in the center of this spherical surface. The flux is defined by the charge in the center of this sphere. There is a beautiful theorem in electrodynamics. You will learn this theorem later when you learn electrodynamics, the course of electrodynamics here. And the theorem says, first, first, if you displace this charge to some other point inside the sphere, 
so that the charge will not be located at the center of the sphere, but it will be located at some arbitrary point inside the sphere. Then the electric flux will not change. It will remain the same. It will be defined by the same charge, which is somewhere inside the sphere. That is the first step. And another step is, uh, so, so if, there is, if, it, if this is true, if, if the flux of electric field, this physical quantity phi, does not depend on the position of the charge inside it, then I can take one charge, a Q1, and another charge, Q2, and another charge, Q3, and each charge will create such an electric flux. It means that the flux <coughs> is the sum of is 4 pi k and the sum of all charges inside the sphere, the sum of all charges here inside the spherical, uh, spherical surface. That is the first <coughs> step. By the way, 4 pi k, we denoted it last time as a 1 divided by epsilon 0, which is an electric constant, electric constant of vacuum. <coughs> So this is 4 pi k is just another notation of uh, 1 over epsilon 0. This is, these are just two constant, two constants k. The constant k and constant epsilon 0 are just rel related uh, through this formula by definition. There is no science in it. It's just the definition. We, are, we have the right to introduce any definition we, we like, any definition. We, we have the right to introduce any quantities which we believe are useful. But whether the introduced quantity will turn out to be really useful, well, it depends. It depends on uh, whether we are smart enough to invent a useful quantity or all the quantity invented will be absolutely uh, unuseful, click, absolutely useless. <coughs> so the first step in an uh, interesting theorem, which is called a Gauss theorem, <coughs> that is the Gauss theorem, Gauss theorem says that if I displace the charge inside the sphere, the flux will not change. And as a consequence, we obtain that the total flux of electric field vector through the surface area of the sphere is defined by the total charge inside the sphere. And the second step in the Gauss theorem is as follows. <coughs> uh, it's proven that if we deform the sphere in any way, if we deform the sphere and obtain some arbitrary closed circuit and calculates the flux of electric field through this arbitrary closed surface, then the result will be the same. The flux through the deformed sphere, deformed, arbitrarily deformed sphere, will be defined by the total electric charge inside this, inside this arbitrary closed surface. That is the essence of Gauss theorem, which is very powerful <coughs> theorem in electrodynamics. <coughs> so if this, is, if this is true and this is proven in the course of electrodynamics, then we can easily calculate <coughs> the electric field strength uh, created by an infinite plane charged infinitely charged, infinite plane, infinite in dimension, and charged mm, plane. And if it's infinite in dimension, then it will carry an infinite charge. But we are interested in a charge which is contained on a unit area of this, of this plane, uh, charged plane. The unit area, or any area S, so if, if we have a charge of the unit area, which I will denote by sigma, then the charge which is found on any surface S of this uh, plane will be equal to the charge contained on the unit area times the surface area. That will give me the total charge contained 
on this area of the infinite plane. And uh, now I will, I will surround this section of the surface area by some surface, closed surface, that will be a cylinder, a cylindrical surface, and the base of the cylinder will have an area S, the base of the cylinder. And the walls, the side walls of the cylinder, will be perpendicular to the surface. I will use such a closed surface. Why do I need such a closed surface? Because the Gauss theorem operates with close, closed surf surfaces and uh, the flux of electric field through the closed surface. So I choose such a closed surface which is convenient in this particular problem. And I know that the electric field flux through any closed sur surface will be defined by the total charge which is found inside this uh, closed surface, <coughs> in the inner volume of this closed surface. And the total charge here will be equal to this expression. That is the uh, area of the cylinder base times the charge density on the surface of the plane. Uh, charge density, that is the charge on a unit area, like an electric charge located on one square meter of this infinite uh, plane. Uh. So what the theorem of uh, the Gauss says, uh, what this Gauss theorem says, that the flux of electric field equal to the total charge inside this surface. Total charge is given by this uh, by this expression, it's proportional to the area uh, of the surface which we, of the plane, area of the plane which we consider. And the electric field will be of, this, of such, a, uh, such a plane, charged plane, will be, uh, we know that if this plane is a conductor, like a metal plane, then the electric field lines will be perpendicular to the surface, perpendicular to the surface of this conductor everywhere. And uh, so it electric field strength will be E on the upper side of the charged plate. Uh, and it will, be the, it will have the same quantity. It will have the same <coughs> value in the lower part of the space. This will be two equal fields because of symmetricity, because of s uh, considerations of symmetry will, considerations of symmetry in this problem dictate that the field, electric field in the upper uh, space shall be equal to the electric field in the lower space uh, beneath this surface, charged surface. So, so that the electric field flux, electric field flux, will be equal to, by definition, that must be the electric field strength times the area of the surface. So, so that the area of the surface uh, of the upper side of the cylinder will be S, and the electric field here will be E in the upper side. And also we have to take into account the lower side of the cylinder. The area will be again equal to S, the area of the base of the cylinder base, and the field will be the same. So that the electric field flux will be equal to 2 E S. And the flux through the uh, side walls will be zero because of two reasons. First of all, the definition of flux includes the uh, dot point of two vectors, but I don't introduce the vector of uh, the surface area. I don't introduce, I don't, I would not like to complicate, uh, I would not like to complicate uh, this reasoning uh, to that extent. So I don't introduce the vector of S, and I don't consider the uh, dot um, product of two vectors. I just say that this cylinder may be taken infinitely uh, thin, so that this thickness of the cylinder may be considered as small as, as we like, infinitely small, just, just embracing the part of the surface of uh, the plane, part of the plane surface. Uh, and so that the, uh, the side walls of the cylinder will have infinitely small area. And therefore, the flux 
uh, of electric field anyway will be infinitely small and negligible through the side walls of this cylinder. So that the total flux uh, through this imaginary surface, cylindrical surface, will be given by this expression 2ES. And that, according to the Gauss theorem, must be equal to uh, total charge inside the chosen closed surface, which is, which is Q, divided by the constant, electrical constant, epsilon 0. <coughs> uh, and the Q is proportional to the area, to the surface area, which is, which is cut out on the plane by the imaginary cylindrical surface, which we introduce here for calculations. So the charge is proportional to Q. Uh, proportional to S. That is the charge density and the <coughs> surface area divided by epsilon zero. <coughs> Considering these two expressions, this one and this one, we discover that the surface area, which is, which is cut out on the, surface, on the plane surface <coughs> uh, of the charged plane, will, will cancel here, and the electric field electric field here will be found in this in this configuration electric field will be equal to the surface density of electric charge on this charged plane divided by 2 epsilon 0 so we have found the electric field created by a charged plane we have found the electric field created by the charged plane, where sigma is the surface density, surface charge density, surface charge density. How many coulombs are located on a square meter of this, of this plane? Such is the electric field created by a single charged plane here in the, inside the capacitor. And this electric field will be directed from the positively charged plane upward. But the negatively charged plane will create similar electric field, which will be directed, which will have the same direction. Therefore, these two electric fields created by the lower plate and by the upper plate will add together to, to, to uh, account for the total electric field inside the capacitor. So the electric field inside the capacitor, this quantity here, will be twice the quantity found for a single charged plane, for a single ch uh, plate charged with uh, charge density sigma. So this is the electric field of a single charged plane. But inside the capacitor, two different planes, two different plates create the electric field. So the electric field inside will be twice the found quantity. So that will be found as, uh, that will be expressed as sigma distance between the plates divided by electrical constant epsilon zero. <coughs> so that is the electric field inside the capacitor. That is the sigma divided by epsilon zero. That is the electric field inside the capacitor. And this formula gives us the potential difference between the capacitor plates. And the potential difference will be equal to the electric field multiplied by the distance between the plates. And so we will obtain such a formula for the potential difference between the capacitor plates if d is the distance between the two plates and sigma is the electric charge density on the capacitor plates. Whatever plate you take, either upper plate or lower plate, sigma will be the same electric charge density because both the upper and the lower plate carry the same charge, and they have the same area, the same area of the plate. So the density, the charge density, will be the same. And we, found, we have found the potential difference, or the voltage, on the capacitor plates. So if we know the voltage, <coughs> if we know the voltage, <coughs> uh, then if we have calculated the electric field strength inside the capacitor, then this formula will give us <coughs> something. Uh, this formula will give us <coughs> the expression for the capacitance, 
I will continue, I will continue this expression here. That will be the charge of the capacitor divided by the electric field strength, which is given by this formula. Sigma divided by epsilon zero. And D is the distance between the plates. And now I will introduce the, uh, I will introduce the, uh, I will introduce whatever quantity it must be here. I have forgotten if it's here or not. Yes, I will introduce the dependence between the charge on the charged plate of the capacitor and the area of the capacitor. The charge will be equal to the charge density. Uh, the, ch the, charge, the charge will be equal to charge density times S. So the charge here ma may be expressed as the charge density times S times epsilon 0 divided by charge density divided by D. So we have found to this expression where the uh, surface density of electric charge will cancel, the surface density will cancel, and we will obtain this formula, which is written in the following way. Uh, that is the electrical constant times the surface area of the plates of the capacitor divided by the distance of between the plates of the capacitor. That is the expression for the capacitance of a plain, plain ca capacitor. If I uh, choose a capacitor consisting of two parallel plates with distance d between the plates and area s of each plate, then the capacitance will be given by this formula. The capacitance will be proportional to the area of each plate and the inversely proportional to uh, the distance between the plates. Now what happens if I take a capacitor, a charged capacitor, and if I fill it with some dielectric medium, with some dielectric medium, so there is some dielectric, like glass or any, any other dielectric medium here, between the plates of the capacitor, I insert here a dielectric slab. What will happen? The, y people usually use uh, dielectrics inside ca capacitors. So what happens? Why does it help? Why does it help to increase? Uh, why does it help increasing the capacitance? Well, in a dielectric, molecules are neutral. But in the external electric field, each molecule is polarized. Each molecule is polarized. That is, the center of negative and positive charges will be displaced in different, uh, in different directions if there is an electric field strength in the, in the space where the molecule is placed. Then the molecule will be polarized. The center of negative electric charge is actually the electron clouds or some parts of, ne of a molecule will be displaced in the direction of positively charged plate. And the positive charge of the molecule, posit the center of positive charge, will be displaced somewhat in the direction of negatively charged plate. Therefore, all the dielectric, all the dielectric will contain, I, I, I show the slab of dielectric, will contain molecules on the surface of dielectric. And the, that molecules will create some positive charge on the upper surface of this dielectric. And the same molecules will be on the lower surface of the dielectric, and they will create some negative charge uh, due, to this negatively, uh, ne due to this negative charges of displaced uh, from the center of the molecule. So the lower, lower surface of this dielectric slab will be uh, charged negatively, and the upper, upper 
side will be charged positively. And these two charges will create its own field, the internal field of the dielectric, internal field inside the dielectric. And this internal field will add to the external field, which is directed upward. And the internal field is directed downward. So these two fields will, uh, the internal field will reduce the upper field when we add these two vector quantities together. The internal field will act in such a way as to reduce the, the, external, the external field. So that if we introduce the dielectric slab here, the electric field inside will be reduced. It will be different. It will not be that quantity, let's call it E0. The final electric field inside the dielectric will be smaller than the initial, initial uh, electric field. So this is electric field when the capacitor is filled with vacuum. That is, no dielectric is inside. If we introduce some dielectric material, then the electric field inside will become smaller. What does it mean, smaller? It means that the original electric field existing in the absence of dielectric slab will be, some, will be somewhat smaller. It will be divided by some positive quantity larger than unity. So we have to divide the value, the magnitude of the original electric field by some figure larger than unity, and we then will obtain the final resulting electric field inside the capacitor field with dielectric. If we take into account this expression, where epsilon is called the dielectric permeability of the material, dielectric permeability, so if we take this into account, we will observe that the electric field strength is placed in the denominator of this formula for the capacitance. So the electric field strength will be E0 divided by epsilon. It means that epsilon will be found in the nominator, finally. Finally, epsilon will be found in the nominator. So it will be found here. In case the ca capacitor is filled with dielectric material, then such will be the formula for the capacitance. That will be the epsilon, the dielectric permeability of the material which fills the capacitor, times the electric constant, times the area of the capacitor plates, and divided by the distance between the plates. So that will be the final. Uh, final expression for the capacitance. Capacitance will be proportional to this dielectric permeability. And as dielectric permeability may be some uh, number larger than unity, sometimes considerably larger than unity, then it will increase the capacitance as this is found in in the denominator, it will increase the capacitance. It means that when we introduce the dielectric here inside the plates, we increase the capacitance of this capacitor. And increasing C, the capacitance, is very useful in, in technical sense of the word. It's useful for radio equipment. We can obtain a larger capacitance by introducing a dielectric in between the plates. <coughs> So this dielectric permeability for, uh, for many substances may be of the order of magnitude 2, maybe 3, 5, 7, 9, 12, well, like 2 times 15. But some, for some substances, like water and ice, especially ice, the dielectric permeability of ice is about 100. It depends on temperature but, and pressure, but it's about 100. And also, there are such peculiar substances which are called ferroelectric, ferroelectrics. For ferroelectrics, the dielectric permeability may be about 1 million and even larger than 1 million, maybe uh, 
hundreds of thousands or up to one million. So the electric field strength in such uh, in such uh, inside such a dielectric slab will be million millions times smaller than the electric field strength in the absence of su such a dielectric. And such dielectrics are called ferroelectrics. And say such ferroelectrics, if you find a proper material, you they will uh, increase the uh, capacitance by hundreds of thousands of times or even millions of times. That's a very interesting situation. Now we will make a small interval, uh, five minutes interval.
so uh, after the interval we will solve some simple problems in electrostatics and uh, the first the first thing I would like to consider is a parallel and consecutive connection of capacitors so imagine we have two capacitors connected in, par in parallel so this one capacitor will have a capacitance C1 and this will have a capacitance C2 and uh, these two connector connections connectors will be denoted by A and B so the total capacitance will be defined by, by definition is the total charge accumulated on this in this battery of capacitors divided by the total potential difference between points A and B between these two points and the total charge here will be the sum of charges of the first capacitor and the second capacitor so it will be Q1 plus Q2 divided by the potential difference AB why so? because the charge of the battery as well as the charge of a single capacitor is defined practically as the charge that will flow from point B to point A in case of short circuiting these two points by some wire if we short circuit, if we connect points A and B by a wire then some charge will flow through this wire and this charge is by definition the charge of the uh, battery and the charge that will flow here will be e obviously will be equal to the charge of the first capacitor which must flow here from from one plate of the capacitor to another plate of the capacitor plus the charge uh, of the second capacitor which also will flow here from one plate to another plate if we short circuit uh, points A and B and that will be equal to Q1 divided by by the potential difference between points A and B plus Q2 divided by the potential difference between points A and B and that by definition is the first capacitance and that by definition is the second capacitance because the potential difference between these two points is actually equal to the potential difference between the plates of the first capacitor that, that is the same potential difference here and the potential difference on the plates because the potential of any conductor is the same this is the conductor well made of metal for example and the potential electric potential of any conductor is the same and this is the same this piece of conductor can is uh, has the same electric potential as well as this uh, the right side piece of conductor has the same uh, electric uh, potential so the potential difference on the first conductor will be equal to the potential difference on the second conductor and will be equal to the potential difference between points A and B so that will be the charge on the first conductor divided by the potential difference between its plates and that by definition is the capacitance of the first capacitor and the same is true for the second capacitor so that will be C1 plus C2 that means that in this case the total capacitance of the battery will be equal to the sum of capacitance and if we have more than two capacitors connected in parallel then here we will have more than two terms in this sum <coughs> in this sum there will be more than two terms well another situation is when we consider a serial connection of capacitors so that will be C1 connected with C2 and we have to find the total capacitance of this battery of several capacitors connected in series in contrast to the previous case when the, when the capacitors were connected in parallel 
now we have <coughs> uh, some different physical uh, physical phenomena. When we charge this battery, when we charge it, some amount of charge will flow from from one plate, from this plate of capacitor, to from point A to point B. When we when we apply a potential difference here, when we apply some potential difference between points A and B, some charge will flow from from point A to point B. That will be for example, some, some amount of electrons, some number of electrons will, will flow here. So this plate of the capacitor will, have, will acquire the charge plus Q, while this plate will acquire the charge minus Q. So this, minus, this plus Q will attract some electrons from this plate along this conductor to this plate, and the, number, the charge of this plate will be also minus Q, because the electrons will flow here until they compensate the, the charge plus Q. And so that here will be also charge plus Q on this plate. So that the charge of each capacitor connected in series will be the same. Th this capacitor will be charged to, uh, will have a charge Q, and this capacitor will have the same charge Q when they are connected in series. That is the main, that is the main thing. And the potential difference between points A and B, according to definition of uh, capacitance, will be equal to the total charge of the battery divided by its total capacitance. <coughs> and uh, the total charge... Uh, so, so this... Ca this potential differences between points A and B. And so there will be some potential difference on the first capacitor, that is between the plates of the first capacitor. I will denote it by U1, some potential difference on the first capacitor, plus some potential difference on the second capacitor. If I, if I carry some small probe charge from point A to point B. I will carry this charge through the conductor. That will require no work uh, to be performed. No work will be performed here because the conductor has the same potential. But there will be a potential difference between the plates. So I will have to produce some work when I carry a probe charge from, from the left plate of the first capacitor to the right plate. I will perform some work. And then I will carry the same charge along this conductor that will require no work at all. And then again, I will produce some work when I carry this charge against the field of the second capacitor. So if I carry some charge from point A to point B through the battery, I will perform some work. And this work will be the sum of works performed on the first capacitor and plus this, the work performed on the second capacitor. And the potential difference is defined uh, through the work performed when we carry some charge. So that if the total work on this section is equal to the, first, to, to the work on the first capacitor plus the work on the second capacitor, it means that the total potential difference is also the sum of potential differences on both uh, capacitors. <coughs> and uh, by definition, the potential difference on the first uh, capacitor will be the charge on the first capacitor divided by the first capacitance plus the potential difference on the second capacitor will be the charge on the second capacitor divided by the capacitance of the second capacitor. And these charges are the same. These charges are the same. We discussed it. And the charge is the same for, for each capacitor. This, this charge is the same for each capacitor. So that if this is the same charge, we can factor this expression by Q. And we will obtain here 1 divided by C1 plus 1 divided by C2. And that will be equal to the initial expression of Q divided by C. Well, looking at this formula, we notice that Q, the charge of each capacitor is the, being the charge of the battery, can be canceled in this formula, and we obtain that 1 divided by the total capacitance of the battery 
will be equal to 1 divided by C1, the capacitance of the first capacitor, plus the inverse capacitance of the second capacitor. That will be the capacitance of the battery. And if there are many capacitors here e connected in series, then we will have more terms in this sum. We will have more terms in this sum. So this formula defines the capacitance in case of serial uh, connection of capacitors. And this formula defines the capacitance of the battery in case of parallel connection. Now I would like to discuss some simple problems in electrostatics, some simple problems. <coughs> For example, problem number 400. A problem number 400. It says, if only one charged body is available, can it be used to obtain a charge exceeding many times in absolute magnitude that which it itself has. Well, <laughs> so if we have only one charged body, that is, uh, for example, a charged ball having some positive charge, and this ball is placed on some insulating support, some insulating support, that the charge is constant and does not change. It doesn't flow away from this charged ball. And the problem is, using this single charged body, we have to obtain a much larger charge on some other body. This problem is solved. It can be solved <coughs> using a so-called Van de Graaff generator. And the idea of Van de Graaff generator is, is as follows. We take a hollow sphere, a hollow sphere conduct, made of conducting material with a small hole in it. So this is a metal sphere made of conducting material, and it has a small hole in it. And we take another small ball of conducting material on an insulating rod, which we can take and move this small rod. And if we place this second ball close to the first charged body at such a small distance, we move it here, and then we connect the second ball with the earth by a wire, then there will be an uh, electrification of this ball through induction. The positively charged ball will attract electrons from the ground. They will go upward to this ball, which will be uh, uh, charged negatively. And then after that, we may disconnect this wire, and take this negatively charged ball and put it inside the hole into the sphere. So this negatively charged ball is inside the hole, is put inside the hole, this inside the sphere, through the hole in it. If we touch this ball against the surface of the sphere from inside, we know that all the charges will flow away and will be distributed along the surface of the sphere. Because the charges, like uh, free electrons, are repelled from one another, and will, they, will tend to to, to, they will tend to distribute along the surface of, along the outer surface of the sphere, so that there will be no charge at all on this small ball. Then we can take it away and repeat the procedure we can put it beside the charged, originally charged ball and connect this small ball with the, the earth 
and after earthing uh, the small ball, we will find it charged negatively through induction because electrons will be attracted to this uh, positive charge. And then we disconnect it and again insert in the uh, sphere through the hole. And uh, what is interesting is that inside the sphere, the potential, electric potential, is constant. And so that we can easily move this ball inside the sphere. And after touching the internal wall of the sphere, the charge, the electric charge again will go, will go to the surface. And the, the charge on the surface will, will increase. And there are no forces acting on electrons inside the sphere. We considered this problem with respect to uh, gravitational interaction. But you know that gravitational interaction between two point masses is described by the same formula, similar formula, uh, as the interaction between the point charges. In gravitation, it's the universal uh, Newton's law of gravitation. And in case of electric charges, it's the Coulomb's law. The, both laws have the same uh, dependence on the distance, that is, inverse square rule. And therefore, the phenomena observed with uh, gravitational forces and electric forces are, in, in most cases, similar. And this similarity uh, tells you, shows you that there are no forces acting on any charge placed inside the charged sphere. If the charges are located on the surface of the sphere, then these charges will not interact with any charge inside the sphere. And therefore, all the charges here inside the sphere will easily flow without any hindrance, will easily uh, flow to the surface of the sphere. And so repeating this procedure for many, many times, we can accumulate a large, large electric charge on the sphere. We can accumulate a very large charge on the sphere, which is much, much larger than the original charge here. The capital Q will be much larger than the original charge, thousands and even millions of times larger than the original charge. That is the idea behind the Van de Graaff generator, which can produce very high charges and very high voltages. In the laboratory conditions, we can obtain very high voltage, such, su so high voltage that it will be possible to obtain a lightning, a lightning inside the laboratory. When this uh, highly charged body is discharged through the atmosphere, so there will be a lightning actually in the laboratory. An immediate discharge, very, very, uh, which happens very quickly. <coughs> uh, actually, in a portion of, in a small portion of a second, all the charge from here will flow out because of very high voltage between this uh, charged ball and the, and the ground and the earth. <coughs> so such is the idea behind the Van de Graaff generator, which can uh, which is able to accumulate very high electric charges using a small initial electric charges and many times repeated procedure, and many times repeated procedure of charging this ball from inside. <coughs> so that is a problem number 400. Another problem is 402. It says, can two lightly charged balls be attracted to each other? So we have two balls, and they are lightly charged. Can they be attracted? We know that the like charges repel. Plus and plus will repel, and minus and minus charge will repel from one another. And the problem says, can two such balls lightly charged be attracted? to each other? The answer is positive, yes. Sometimes likely charged balls can be attracted to one another. How can we understand it? Well, suppose one ball is charged and another ball is uncharged. Not, not charged. The charge is zero. But if this is a metal ball made of conducting material, then the charge on the first ball 
will polarize the second ball in such a way that electrons or negative charges will be concentrated on this part, and positive charges uncompensated will be left on the opposite, opposite side of the ball. <coughs> this uh, polarization happens because all negative charges are attracted to the original positive charge. In this case, these negative charges will be attracted, attracted to, to the positively charged ball with some force F1. And the positive charges will be repelled from the ch positively charged ball with some force F2. But the positive charges are located farther away from the center of the first ball, so that the force of re repulsion F2 will be smaller than the force of attraction F1. The force of repulsion acting between these two positive charges will be smaller than the force of attraction acting between unlike charges. Because unlike charges, the negative charges are closer here. So the, in the charges are the same. The negative charge equals the positive charge. The charges are the same in magnitude. But the forces of interaction will be different because the distance is different. So that this ball will be attracted with the net force equal to F1 minus F2. And that will be larger than 0. That will be a force of attraction between the balls. And I considered the situation when the first ball was charged and the second ball was originally not charged. It carried zero total charge. And the force of attraction appears only due to polarization of the second ball. But there is a positive force of attraction. Now we continue this experiment by adding some positive charge here, adding some small amount of positive charges here. That will result in additional repulsion between the balls. But the, the initial force was the force of attraction, and it was larger than 0, so it cannot be canceled immediately. We, we can put some additional positive charge. If it's not large, then the force of repulsion will be smaller than the force of attraction, and still the balls will keep re attracting, keep attracted, being attracted to one another. Uh, certainly, if we put a large positive charge here, then the force of repulsion will become larger than this original force of attraction. Certainly, in the long run, if we continue this process of charging the second ball, they will repulse. But when the charge on the, on the second ball is small enough, the additional positive charge, then these two positively charged balls will still be attracted to one another because the original attraction was larger than zero and it cannot be canceled immediately. That is the solution of this problem number 402. Two likely charged balls can certainly be attracted to one another. Well, now problem number 409. This problem says that we have a conducting plate, like a metal plate, bearing charge plus Q. And there is another plate, uncharged plate with no charge, with zero charge. Certainly, due to induction, electrons will be attracted to this surface. And there will be some charge minus Q on the left surface of this plate. And the remaining positive charge will be on the right, on the right side of this plate. And that will be equal to plus Q. Due to induction, the charges will be separated some negative charge will be here, will come here, and some positive charge will remain on the opposite side of the plate. So we must find this charge. What is it? How can it be fi found? If we know that the charge of the first plate was given, it's Q, and the distance between the plates is small, 
as compared to the dimension of the plate. <coughs> Such is the problem 409. What are the charges induced on the surfaces of the other plate? So how can we find these two charges? We know for sure in this problem that if the second plate is a conducting plate, like a metal plate, then the field, electric field inside, is zero. I show you this. Electric field inside must be zero. Because inside any conductor, the field is zero in electrostatics when charges don't move, when all electric charges are in static equilibrium then the field inside, the electric field inside the conductor must be zero. That is not true in electrodynamics. In electrodynamics, the field inside the conductor may not be zero. It may be some varying dynamical field of an electromagnetic wave, which may penetrate into the conductor. Sometimes it penetrates to a considerable distance, <coughs> but not in this case, not in case of electrostatics. The field inside must be zero. And we have considered today the electric field generated by a charged surface, a plane surface. And we discovered that the electric field generated by a surface is, for example, by this charged surface. The electric field generated by this charged surface is proportional to the charge of the surface. Actually, it's proportional to the charge density on the surface. But as the dimension of these plates is large but fixed in the problem, it doesn't change then, uh, it's obvious that the, that the field, electric field generated by this uh, surface of the plate is proportional to the charge of this plate. So it, must be, it may be, it may be uh, expressed as the electric field proportional to the charge of the plate. So this is the electric field created by the first plate. And I will show it in this way. This is the electric field E1 created by the first plate. That is E1 created by the first charged plate. And it must be proportional to the charge on this plate. We considered this problem using the Gauss theorem today, but we don't need the exact expression for this coefficient of proportionality. We, we just must know in this problem we have to use only the proportionality between the electric field generated by a charged plane and the total charge on this, on this plate. <coughs> the same th thing is true for other charged plates here. Let us consider the electric field generated by, by this negatively charged plate. <coughs> the electric field direction coincides with the direction of a force acting on a small positive probe charge. So if we take a positive probe charge here, it will be attracted to the negatively charged surface. And also so that the electric field of the second uh, surface here will be directed towards the surface, both outside, both on the left-hand side of the surface and on the right-hand side of the surface. So the electric field created by the second surface here, um, by this charge, will be directed here and will also be proportional to the surface charge, that is minus Q here. So that will be the electric that will be the electric field created by the second surface and I will denote it by E2. So E2 created by the second surface inside the conductor will also be proportional to the surface charge that is small q. And I and note that this field is directed against the field E1. E2 is directed against E1 uh, inside the conductor, so that this must be taken with minus sign, because inside the conductor it has different direction, opposite direction opposite to the field E1. 
Now we can say that the field created by another plate, that is this, the third, another surface, uh, the right side surface of this plate. And that will be also the field created by positive charge. So that will be directed from the positive charge away. And inside the conductor, that field will be directed oppositely to the E1. So the field E3 created by the third charged surface will also be proportional to the charge Q and will be directed against the original field E1. So that will be <coughs> minus alpha Q, where Q is the charge on this surface. The charge is positive, but the field strength is directed to the left, the field strength created by this surface. On another surface, on the opposite surface of the same plate, the charge is negative, but the field strength is also directed to the left. So the field strength will have the same sign here. And we know that the field inside the plate, inside the conductor, must be zero. It means that the sum of all these three fields must be zero. It means that alpha q minus alpha small q minus alpha small q, that is the sum of these two terms, all this must be zero. Alpha will be canceled from this equation, and we immediately obtain that the small, small charge generated on the surface of the second plate the small charge will be equal to large capital Q divided by 2. So we have found the charge generated or induced on the side of the second plate. On the left side, this charge will be negative. On the right side, this charge will be positive. We have found it. It's half the initial charge on the first plate, which was, which was charged to me initially. <coughs> That's the answer to from problem number 409. Now another simple problem. Which will be problem number four, 413. A point electric charge, so problem number 413. A point electric charge is at a distance d from a large current conducting plate, that is a conducting plate. Find the force with which the plate acts on the point charge. So we have a point charge, a point charge plus Q, and a conducting or metal plane at a distance d, at a distance d. And we have to find the force of interaction between the point charge and the plane. It's obvious that if this conducting plane is infinite, then anyway, the electrons will be attracted to this positive charge, and they will flow here. And here will be some density, surface density of of electrical charge, of negative electric charge. And the, the farther we go from the, uh, from the plus Q charge, the smaller will, will be the electron density on the surface of this, of this plane. So the largest density of negative charge will be here. And then as we go uh, upward or downward, the density of electric charge here on the plane will be diminished, will become smaller and smaller. So we have to find the force of interaction between this point charge, the force of attraction between the point charge and the infinite conducting plane. This problem can easily be solved using the so-called method of mirror imaging. The mirror image, mirror image method is a very powerful method in electrostatics. Let's consider two charges, first of all, the positive charge and some negative charge. The electric field between this, uh, in the space abo about these two charges is known. The electric field lines will have something, will have such a structure. And you, can, you may continue this picture. So that will be the electric field lines. And due to symmetricity, of this figure, we may 
we may uh, conclude that if we consider this surface, which is perpendicular to the uh, distance to the section connecting the two charges and going through the center of this section, then this plane perpendicular and uh, located at the center uh, will cross the field lines at the right angle. So these angles will be uh, the right angles, <coughs> 90 degrees. Because, because of considerations of symmetry, because of considerations of symmetry, all these angles will be right angles. And now uh, recall, now return to the original problem. Here also must be some lines, field lines. And we know that field lines are always perpendicular to the surface of the conductor. So this angle must, be, must always be the right angle. The angle between the field lines here and the conductor must be the right angle. So re considering this situation, we understand that if we insert a very thin conducting plate here through the center uh, between the two charges, a very thin conducting plate, then it will not change the field structure. The field lines must be perpendicular to the surface of this conducting plate. But if it's conducting, if it's uh, a metal plate, then the field lines will automatically be perpendicular to the metal plate. So we considered it. Field lines are always perpendicular to a uh, uh, surface of any conductor. So if we insert here a very thin metal plate conducting, uh, then this, all these angles will be the right angles. And that means that the field structure will not be changed by introducing a small, uh, a thin, very thin conducting plane. And th that means that if the field structure is not changed, that means that the force of interaction of point charge and the plane will be the same as the force of interaction between these two point charges. And we can immediately uh, write down the expression for this force using the Coulomb law. That will be the constant K Q squared divided by, by this distance from the plate, from the charge to the plate. And here the distance is twice as large because, because, of, because this distance is also must be uh, D. So 2D squared will be 4 d squared. That will be the force of interaction between the point charge and the plane, and the charged plane. Why this method is called a method of mirror imaging? Because this negative charge here, minus q, looks like a mirror image of the original point charge. And this plane must be considered as a mirror, as a mirror. And the negative charge will be a mirror image of the original positive charge located at the same distance d from the mirror, behind the mirror. So the interaction, electrostatic interaction between the point charge and this plane, uh, conducting plate, will be equal to, uh, due to this mirror image method, will be equal to the electrostatic interaction between the two point charges, the original charge and its mirror image. Why so? Because the picture of electric field will not be changed if we introduce here, insert here a thin conducting plate. <coughs> so that is the solution of problem number 413. That is the correct answer. On this point, let us finish this lecture. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>